from Interfaith Alliance, this is State of Belief Radio. I'm Interfaith Alliance President Reverend Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch, broadcasting this week from New York City. A cheerleader for the Black River Falls Tigers named Peyton arrived with her f- off sign. It means, she said, if you don't believe in women's rights, you can just literally go f- off. You ain't getting no p- You ain't getting nothing. It meant, she said, rage. It's a theme we focus on a lot on this program, the various ways Christian nationalism threatens both democracy and religion in this country. The movement often uses war imagery, staking an arbitrary claim to being on the side of good versus evil. An important new book adds to our understanding of the threat and why it's so attractive to some Americans. And it doesn't shy away from the language of battle. On this week's show, you'll hear Jeff Charlotte, author of the newly released The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. You can hear State of Belief on the radio and get the podcast on Apple Podcasts and all other podcast platforms. Every week, I am in conversation with the most fascinating and impactful civic and religious leaders across the nation. Please subscribe today. State of Belief Radio is made possible in great part by the generous support of you, our listeners. If you've made a donation, thank you for helping these conversations be heard by more people who need them. If you haven't pitched in yet, information on how you can help keep this show on the air is available at stateofbelief.com. And you can find out more about the work of Interfaith Alliance and join us at interfaithalliance.org. And now to my guest. We've all benefited from the sophisticated investigative writing Jeff Charlotte brought to his best-selling books, The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power, and C Street, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy. In recent years, Jeff's writing has been more personal and more literary. Without abandoning those qualities, he's back on the subject to which he contributed so much with those earlier books, our fragile culture, our vulnerable democracy, and the threats the political religious right poses to both. This week, Jeff Charlotte released The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. The glowing New York Times Review describes the book as, quote, an anguished quest to understand the rise of anti-democratic extremism. And I'm so pleased it brings the author back to State of Belief Radio. Jeff, thanks so much for being with us in the studio. Hi, Paul. So many people may not know your personal background, and this is a very, feels like a very personal book. Um, And so I wonder if you can start by placing yourself in the context of America, in the context of religious America, and and who are you as you come into this incredible book? So I've been been writing about religion for... uh over 20 years and writing about um, uh, right-wing movements, uh, which sometimes overlap, uh, for about 20 years. And uh, these sort of topics sort of interweaving. And and I come to these, uh, I'm a secular Jew who is fascinated and I'm sort of drawn, in fact, to religion writing and writing about right-wing movements by the same thing, which is, is, is I'm alarmed by the right-wing movements, but I'm also fascinated by belief systems that I don't share. Um, uh, how does it make sense for the world to look like that? And some of these right-wing beliefs are are so distant from mine, it's the biggest sort of leap to imagine how, how they see the world. And so I was doing that, and uh, this book, you're right, it is a very personal book for me. It's uh, um, uh, It spans, you know, roughly 10 years, um, but the greater part of it is post-Trump and uh, um, sort of coming out of the grief of the pandemic um, and uh, the toll of these years on all of us, on my family, and uh, feeling that fascism, which I once would have said is not possible in America. There's other kinds of bad. I don't mean to be Pollyannish about that. I just sort of said it's a different kind of bad. But now here's the actual thing um, uh, is here. And terrified for my kids and terrified for myself. And um, I'm a little bit counterphobic. So if I'm frightened, I think the thing to do is to go and look at the thing. It's amazing. I want to read a quote from the end of the essay. Um, 
that is the uh, the title essay, The Undertow, and you say it, it, it's when you've come back from this long yeah. journey. You say it's after midnight. I'm up in Vermont, Green Mountains, a narrow, steep road. I have gone neither over nor mm-hmm. under America. I have gone through it. And when I read that, I, it literally made me pause. And I was like, I screenshot it because I was like, this is such a beautiful way that to articulate the way I experienced the writing of this book. I have to say, the, the writing is exquisite. Congratulations. It's beautiful. It, it brought me in in a way. And, you, you know, you, you're a great writer because it's vivid. At one point you say, like, concentrate on the bodies. And indeed, I concentrated on the bodies, all the bodies. And it was, it's a treat. This is a book that I really do recommend. It's powerful and it is, uh, it's a journey. I mean, it is a journey. And so I I wanted to, you, you, you. You kind of frame it in like three movements. It's yeah. all almost operatic in that yeah. way, um, you know. Like you, and and you start with Harry Belafonte, yeah. which I just thought, wait, <laughs> what am I reading? I thought I was like, I, I assumed I was going to go straight into yeah. like the Trump and you know all mm. this kind of stuff. But you go straight into Harry Belafonte, almost as a way of beginning to understand like the contours of America in a different through another life. And uh, it introduces us yeah. to kind of the kind of writing we're about to experience. Can you talk about the structure of the book and and a little bit of like the journey you've taken over the last ten years to write it? Yeah, it it it's sort of broken up. There's three sections, each named for a song. The first one is named uh, for Deo by Harry Belfonte. You know, the ban- banana boat song, which everyone thinks is sort of a fun novelty tune. But I've always been fascinated by these songs that have deeply radical roots, um, and that somehow get sort of smoothed and and sanded down by consumer culture, by (laughs) capitalism is great at taking beautiful, rare, radical objects and making them safe. And it tried to do that with Harry Belfonte, who uh, some listeners may know is one of the great radical artists of the 20th and 21st century. Um, and also the man who bankrolled the civil rights movement. Um, I mean, to an extent that it would not have been possible without him. Unbelievable. So, that story you tell, uh, you know, I, you know, it kind of, it's for someone who's been around as long as we both have, I think we're, con- you might be a little younger, but you know, we, we have this idea that we know the stories yeah. and yet you always can learn new stories. And the story about when Harry Belafonte and I think it was Sidney Poitier, Sidney Poitier, yeah, brought in down Mississippi yeah. seventy thousand dollars, and how they were chased. They brought cash because, um, uh, you know, as Harry explained. So the way that came about is, and the movement is, I start with this this song, Deo, and Deo is on hope. I wanted to start the book with on hope. And I know it's a weird move. Here's this book about the Trump scene, and you open it up and like, wait a minute, now i got to read about Harry Belfonte. <laughs> Trust me, Harry is our guide. Um, he's more than our guide. He's, in, in some ways, uh, I think, a prophetic speaker, especially if we understand prophecy in the terms that Cornell West lays out, which is not, you know, uh, uh, foreseeing the future, but describing concrete evil in the moment. Um, but Harry, um, I, I got to spend a lot of time with him, and he told that story about uh, uh, he wants to get money down to um, the activists and organizers in Mississippi, black man wiring money to Mississippi, and that, you know, in the 1960s would be like sending them a death warrant. He's got a delivery. He calls up Sidney Poitier, and he says, you know, they might not kill two famous black men. Uh, turns out the Klan was ready to do it, and it yeah. was this wild chase, and they got there, and they got there in the middle of the night, and he dumps his doctor's bag of cash, and people start breaking out and singing Deo, and then he changes the words, freedom come, and we yeah. want to come home. Yeah. That song, it's a work song. It's a labor song. He learned it on the docks in Jamaica. It's about banana boat workers, the very banana boats he rode back and forth as a boy, uh, who are frustrated with the world, who want, they want to have some rum, they want to relax. It's also a, the, the idea that resistance is about making something beautiful and, mm. and thinking something beautiful. And I needed that, I needed that to be at the beginning. The book is bookended by hope, with Harry at the beginning and, uh, and a more forgotten singer named Lee Hayes. But if you've ever heard, uh, if I had a hammer or yeah. or any number of songs, that was American so Songbook, amazing to me. Who I, I I had never heard about him. Also, you know, being gay to hear that 
a part of the Weavers' legacy was there's this gay man who was part of this broad folk music. I mean, I know he might not have identified that, but he did have these desires. I mean, desires he did. And, he, did. He, was, he was sort of semi... He, in he the was closet. fairly closeted. I mean, yeah, he would make up stories. He of also wrote, he wrote gay erotica. Yeah. Um, I, I, I didn't mean to like focus too much on that, but it was like... Oh, no, I think, you know, I think it's I think important. It's interesting. I think and, it's important, and, and actually, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> Don McLean, who figures in the story because Don McLean... Um, uh, so Lee Hayes was part of the Weavers. Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie would sometimes sing with right. them. And people don't realize, the third the third part of the book is called Goodnight Irene, and it's on surviving. Another song sanded down. Goodnight Irene, you know, I'm not going to sing for you. No. It would be terrible. But um, many, many listeners know it. It sounds like a sort of a sweet song. But remember that line, sometimes I take a notion to jump in the river and drown. Mm. It's about an addict struggling. Mm. Um, it's about how you keep going when you're in such pain. And I thought that's... And it was a top of the charts in 1950. A few years later, they're blacklisted. They can't get a booking anywhere. Right. And right. Lee Hayes... Uh, was broken by the experience. Don McLean, years later, goes up the Hudson River where Lee Hayes is living in a little shack and he's sort of losing his body by parts to various disorders and filling ashtrays with smoke. And um, uh, uh, Don McLean wants another song for his you know, American Pie album. And what should I sing, Lee Hayes? And Lee Hayes uh, says, by the waters of Babylon. He says, mm. just just sing the psalm. Mm. And uh, I, I do like that Don McLean song. Now, I wrote, this piece was the first thing I wrote in the book, and I wrote it years ago, and I I, I, I haven't told this story publicly, but I'm thinking about it. I think we, because you mentioned the queerness of Lee yeah. Hayes and, and yeah. that being the front line right now. I remember Don McLean uh, was furious about that. He said, why did you have to, why did you have to talk about that? And I said, you know, I, I didn't realize you're anti-gay. I'm not anti-gay. It's just not something you have to talk about. Right. And that's part of our that's part of our past too. That's part right. of right. that's part of the left struggle. The things that didn't get talked about. So I bookended that, and then the middle of the book, um, another song. Dream On by Aerosmith, oh which is a God. song when I was oh attending my God, Trump rallies. It's so, I mean, I, I <laughs> which really I love, by the way. I love yeah, that of course, song. we all love it. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, but but it's so. Great, and now hearing you kind of help me, help me breaking this down, and especially given some of the the investigation you did, and I want to get into that in a second around the role of dreaming and the role of yeah. Gnosticism and all right. of this in right. the right. Um, right. in that in the kind of Trumpocene you call it uh, Trumpocene, a term uh, coined by a friend of mine, Jeff Ruoff, a filmmaker, and uh, you know some you may have heard of the Anthropocene. I think Trumpocene is 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 a, is a, is a wonderful term that, that that Jeff Ruoff coined, um, and and the very much. And I want to say this because some listeners out there, well, I don't think Trump's coming back. It doesn't matter. We're still in the Trumpocene. The, the undertow. The title of the book is about the forces that were drawing us to this place. Now we're in it. He's opened the floodgates, um, and. You know, the, the the people that I speak to in the book, there's one prophet, he says, you know, Trump is returning, whether it's Trump or his spirit in some other man. Mm. DeSantis will mm. do, or some mm. other name. Mm. The age of Reagan went from 1980, I would argue, to 2016, mm. in which government and so much world organization and power was framed by the steps that Reagan mm. took. Mm. Now we live in the Trump scene, with or without Trump. And... Um, uh, and that's a dream politic, right? And people think dreams, dreams are good. Well, not unless they're scary. Yeah. And I think so much of fascism is a dream politics. Fa uh, make America great again. Make it like it never was and never will be. And some even know that, but they love the fantasy and the stories. Um, one of the things that I, I really wanted to get across in this book and why I framed it with, with these great, these Harry Belfont and Lee Hayes, long in the struggle, Lee no longer with us, Harry in his 90s, um, both of them, I should say, defeated. Uh, and Harry is an angry, the last line of his story, uh, you know, 
The civil rights movement did not succeed. Look where we are. Mm. Lee Hayes died a broken man. The, mm. uh, the last line of the book, and I'll give it away, it's a spoiler, because it was the first line in my mind. It was the thing that I'm writing toward that. Mm. Lee Hayes describing being in the back of a car uh, with a, some in Arkansas, Arkansas night uh, with some organizers. And it's like it's like Harry and Sidney, you know, running from the Klan, but they start singing together. And Lee, who in many ways, big towering guy, not in many ways brave and in many ways by his own account not. He was frightened. But he said, for a while it was possible not to be scared even. And that was the last line I'm I'm going to. And that's the hope that I have. The yeah. hope is not it's gonna be okay because we are in the Trump scene. We are in we're in Dream On, the Aerosmith song that played at Trump rallies and people would do spinning dances, twirling around. I did too. Um that was part of what I did in this book is I I I, I don't stand apart. And I think my idea, it's just like if you go to a, 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 a any kind of religious service, you're in it. Yeah. You're in it. You, 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 you know, you're not standing over here taking your notes. If people say, let's sing a song, you sing the song with them. Right. Um, right. Uh, we are in this together. Well, and that's not I, always a good I think thing. that the, you know, I, I want to come back to that not being afraid. Because I think yeah. that that is actually a really powerful, um, what, is that, what does that mean as a... As a as a goal, as a moment, but just for a while. I I want to um just you know dive into your experience, uh, just being part. I mean, as you say, like one of the amazing things about this book is is how um, empathy might be the right word, but it might not be. But but trying to report really what you're seeing, rather than coming at it with like. This is my lens. This is how I'm going to judge everything that's happening to me. Instead, really trying to understand it so that you can bring it up. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have a perspective in the book. No. Uh, you, obviously, you do. But it is really, it is fascinating. I, I want to commend you because it's, you know, generally what I do is I, I stand apart. And because in part, which is because, a, I, it's a because I'm afraid, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, and in part because I'm afraid, in part because there's I'm, things to be learned from doing that yeah, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but I but I, I really you know it really was helpful for me to kind of come close the way you came close, and um, you know so so what you know I, I there's moments I want to get into yeah. in in the book, but overall like how did you prepare yourself? You know just to like decide where you decided to go and how you decided to show up in those moments. Like, what was it like as a, as a journalist, as a writer, coming into those moments and saying, okay, this is how I'm going to come into this moment of people with whom I strongly disagree with? Um, well, you use the word empathy, and I think that is the right word. I think it's a word that's kind of being very widely misunderstood right now um, as a virtue, and it's not. Um, and it's being conflated with sympathy, Mm. Sympathy means I'm I'm in sympathy with this movement. Uh -huh. No, no, right. you can have empathy for the devil, yeah. and I think um, you know, I think a lot. How do we tell stories about fascism? Because the ways we've been using have not, you know. Harry was defeated. Lee Hayes was defeated. These are, you know, better souls than me. Um, the the old ways aren't going to work. We have to keep thinking, and um, we have to enter their imaginative space, and and and. That's what always drew me into writing about religion is that I that I got to enter that imaginative space, um, and yeah. and 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 people would welcome me. But um, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me about this book is that that did so. The big the, the title essay is called "The Undertow," and it's this long story. Uh, it's most of the book um, where on January six, a woman named Ashley Babbitt was killed. Um, she was an insurrectionist climbing through a glass window. White woman. Um, and uh, a black Capitol Police officer shot her, and we saw that in real time almost on that day. And as soon as I saw that, I knew what was going to happen because I'm an American, um, and this is one of the oldest American stories. It's a lynching story. Black man kills uh, uh, an innocent white woman, and in fact, very quickly, Ashley was 35, but then people started saying she was in her 20s. No, she was 16. They were aging her backwards right. into the innocence of girlhood, right? Right. So I decided I wanted to follow this martyr myth, and I was coming out of the pandemic, and I flew across the country to Sacramento, California, for a rally in her name that turned into a brawl between Proud Boys and Antifa. And, and then I just decided 
I had some personal business. I had to pick up my stepmother's ashes in, uh, in, in Colorado. I'm just going to drive across the country. I'm going to follow the insurrection tra- trail. I'm not going and talking to important people. I, I, I'm not looking for trouble. Um, I'm just going to drive and, and, you know, a road trip story, but road trip story, as you said, through this yeah. country right now. And of course, I did meet a lot of January Sixers and I met so Ooh. many more guns, I'm, people with guns. I'm not afraid of guns. I am a gun owner, uh, but there's more guns. And that moment, this is the thing that sort of I think is interesting and the turning point that people need to be aware of. It used to be as a writer, I could go into any right wing church anywhere and they would say it's no accident you came here god sent you or you know, we know you're awful but you're gonna send our message now they show up with guns they're, they're, it, it's not they don't care if i'm converted right um right well even the flags you have a, at one point you have a progression of images and, yeah. and where the, the flags become more and more laden with guns but what was interesting about the story when you showed up to the um ashley babbitt you know, I don't. It wasn't rally, a memorial, but yeah. but what's that? It was a rally. Yeah, I mean, it was a good, yeah. kind of. Rally, but her mother spoke at it. But yeah. then you were invited by four four different people talked about this one church. Yeah, and I thought that you know, for me as a minister and as yeah. someone who's really yeah. like, that was you know one of those moments where I was just like, what is happening? And so let me you could just tell us about that church i mean it sounded like first of all that you were there for hours and uh and um also that there was just a a kind of it was a it was a church like i had never imagined i have to say so tell us about that experience of going to this this church that is kind of the the religious embodiment of in some ways what you're it is it is a militia church and and as i say i've been to so many right-wing churches over the years this was the church of glad tidings in yuba city uh california uh north of sacramento uh nowheresville as the pastor uh dave dave bryan sort of says people like to to uh, uh scoff at it but he calls it foreversville um, or he says, Yuba Duba Do. I mean, he's sort of this corny guy, but a very militant pastor coming from, you know, deliverance ministries, you know, driving out um, illness and so on. COVID, he refused to shut his doors. And it's a, it's not a huge church. It's sort of like a mini mega, but big enough and, and open defiance enough um, and with the support of what's called a constitutional sheriff, um, one of these sheriffs who think they're the highest authority in the county and that they don't have to follow laws. It stayed open the whole pandemic and it got this national profile and suddenly, you know, right wing fingers like like Candace Owen are, are making trips to to speak there. Mike Dinesh Flynn. D'Souza. Mike Flynn. Mike Flynn, you may have seen a video went viral for a little while of um, Mike Flynn being uh, presented uh, uh, an AR-15 right. um, uh, uh, there. Speaking of guns. Speaking of guns. Yes. And and. Um, uh, uh, and the pastor was actually presented a gun, and Mike Flynn makes a um, the the pastor's gun a customized AR-15 um, with Joshua 1:9 on it in Hebrew, which has become this battle verse. And they had a special guest speaker uh, that night. It was Saturday night, uh, hours and hours. A man David Strait, who was sort of in the what's called the sovereign citizen movement, the folks who believe that uh, you know. Uh, every man really is an island. They are the one one country. And the most outlandish stuff I've heard, and I've heard a lot. So, for instance, I have news for you. Hillary Clinton was actually executed a long time ago. Yeah. You've seen her since. Using green, green screens, screens yeah, right, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, Trump is still president. Um, the 19th president, because all the others have been illegal. And I'm looking around at the crowd, and I'm like, is, is this preacher going to lose them now? Because it says 45 on Trump's hat. But no, he's in the word, and I think that's your clue. And I would talk to folks afterward, and they'd be nice folks, and you know, they wouldn't be raving. These were sort of, you know, semi-suburban, middle-class people I'd talk to a young college student, and she's like, yeah, I hadn't heard that about Hillary Clinton before. That's really interesting. You learn so much at church. More with Jeff Charlotte is coming right up. If you miss any part of today's program, you can hear full episodes of State of Belief anytime on our website. You'll also find links to the topics we discussed this week and an archive of past shows, all on stateofbelief.com. You're listening to State of Belief Radio, where religion and democracy meet.
I, I want to read a quote that you yeah. had. You know, you, you talked to an expert. Yeah, about, yeah. It was about a Hebrew term, but it, it can be extrapolated much broader than yeah. that. You yeah. said, it's satisfying with an, when an expert flattens a false claim. <laughs> That's how so many of us believe we'll resist the undertow of civil war, fact-checking our way out back to solid ground. But much like the cross for Pastor Dave, such corrections miss the point. You can't fact check a myth. I'm so glad you bring that up. I should say for listeners, the cross, Pastor Dave, there are no crosses in this church. Some listeners to this show may know that the church considers itself in the, the spiritual heritage of, um, what's his name, is it A.A. A. Allen? Okay. okay. Uh, you know, the, the uh, um, famous sort of deliverance ministry guy, his, uh, 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 the, the pastor's wife is his uh, granddaughter. Um, uh, but no crosses anymore. The pulpit is made of swords. And that's his point. He says, the cross, he says, you know, it, it's we're familiar with muscular Christianity, but they're taking it a step further. And the metaphors, the way I think the moment we're in now, the metaphors are becoming very concrete. Spiritual war is a metaphor until so many people, like for Ashley Babbitt on January 6th, it means smashing a window and breaking into the Capitol with a knife. Suddenly spiritual war is real. Suddenly the cross, that's, that's too much of a metaphor. So what do they replace it with? A sword, and you can talk to them, and you can you can explain all the ways in which they're wrong. And and I actually love the detail. He says, "Did you know there's no word for coincidence in the Bible?" Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't read the original, so I called Seth Sanders at UC Davis, one of great uh, Hebrew scholars, and he goes, like, He's like, "Yes, well, yeah, there is." Yeah, yeah, there is. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that was, and it was so. That's what I mean. It's so satisfying, yeah. and I think. Um, you know, you look at social media and I think so many liberals just like take great satisfaction. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what else wasn't true? That you have a right to enslave other people. That didn't stop. It, 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 no one in the North said, oh, and this, the, the white son said, oh my, why didn't anybody tell me this? Oh, Thank yeah. you for the correction. Yeah. We're going to fix this. Yeah, no, right. you have right. a horrific, horrific war. Um, I screenshotted a lot of your book and I, I just say, you know, I love the cross, but sometimes symbolism demeans that which it was meant to represent. <laughs> Now is the time for war, spiritual or otherwise. You know, yeah. I, there was just like, you know, a moment there. And so I'm curious, like, from all of this, like, you've seen an arc, like, before the 2016 election. Yeah. You were covering I've Trump rallies. Right you were there. For, and, like, people yeah, waiting for this, like, big, gorgeous, big, plane, you know, to come and You're trying to be in. polite. It was absolutely, they speak of it in, in absolutely sexual terms, yeah. static terms, and it's easy to yeah. giggle at that and then think, no, wait a minute. If people are experiencing things sexually, ecstatically, yeah. Yeah. pay attention because it's got power. Pay attention because it has a deep impact. And so yeah. there's, an, there's an arc and we're right there. And the question I have for you today, you know, we're talking just as there's some possibility and maybe by the time this airs, Trump will be indicted. Yeah. And there's such a belief in Trump. And, you know, I want to, I want to, you know, get into the, the belief in Trump. But, you know, what, what, if anything, does any of that have to do, like him, him being indicted? I mean, probably it reinforces some, you know, some narrative um, that is, is out there he, about He thinks he it is. does. I, you know, sort of a, a, a job hazard is since 2015, I every day get several emails and texts from the Trump campaign. Um, and you, you can't opt out. <laughs> this, you can check in, but you can never leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, um, you know, every now and then I'm like, I'm just not going to write about this anymore. And you can't get rid of it. So I get it. And, it, and I think he trolled us. I think that was fairly masterfully done. He got the media. To, he wasn't going to be arrested. Tuesday, and I think we knew that last week, but he got the media to sort of breathlessly wait yeah, yeah, yeah. all day right. talking about Trump, and that's all he wants. Right, right, right. Um, uh, uh, we read that he's been giving great thought to, like, what kind of face should I make for my perp walk? Mm. He's emailing multiple times, and what was funny, for days he kept emailing saying, friends, this may be the last time mm. I get to speak to you. Mm. And it's funny, right? And it makes me think of Tale of Two Cities and, you know, Sidney Carton. And it's a noble thing I do. And, but I think theologically we should understand it in terms of that arc. And there is an arc in the, in the book in that sense. That in the beginning, in the beginning, and in 2016, the theology of Trump rallies, and it wasn't much reported on, just like the preachers who opened every rally, far-right preachers of color, 
and you see the press corps and they're just looking at their phones because that's not the news because religion, of course, can never be the news. Trump's not really religious, so it's not how religion works. Right. And, um, and then he'd come out and he would preach prosperity, prosperity gospel. Right. Look at my beautiful plane. You can have it too. So we knew that. 2020, it turns. It's much darker. It's QAnon. Um, right. And it's this bastardized American Gnosticism. I say that with no disrespect to the great Elaine Pagels, who uh, at one point was distressed. Or he said, said, I heard that you're saying that this is not I'm like, no, 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 no. But they understand it. Many people within QAnon, they think Gnosticism makes a lot of sense. The secrets within. Yeah. It's turned again or rather deepened. Right. It's, it doesn't give up any of those things. It, it builds. This is the undertow. Ashley Babbitt, I think, is the turning yeah. point uh-huh. of martyrdom. Yeah. And right. now we're in the martyr phase, which is a very, very scary, we, you know, wealth, secrets, martyrdom, right? And I think we're going to see, we're seeing martyrdom over and over and over, uh, um, you know, uh, what it's part of the, the absolutely hateful anti-trans attack what they're trying to do, they both hate trans people and they want to make trans kids martyrs, kids mm. who are sacrificed. Mm. You know, I, I happen to have a, a, a queer trans child. Um, and the idea is that those of us, that the enemy yeah. has sacrificing their children, that those are martyrs. And Trump realizes this is the theological moment now. So that's why he's saying, you may never hear from me again, as if he's going into the, you know, into the dungeon and so on. Um, send money now. Goodbye, friends. Goodbye. Yes, yes, um, yes. And but you know I am with you. I mean, I will is, always be with I you. I will always be in yeah. your hearts. And I, I do think that, you know, just to say a little bit, uh, uh, come back to that Gnosticism thing you were talking about. I, I do think that there is... Again, it's something that you cannot fact check away right? because you're not seeing what they're seeing. You right. don't know what they know. And this is, I think, at the heart of QAnon yeah. and the QAnon Trump fusion now is, is this incredible um, – Gnosticism, and you, you, you have this great. I'm gonna, sorry, I keep quoting you at you, yeah. uh, but I'm going to do it again. The Gospel of Thomas, the doubting one, does yes. of course does not reside with Mar- Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the King James. But then Trump doesn't read the Bible; he doesn't need to. Rule books are for losers. Reading is for losers. The Gospel of Trump, like that of Thomas, non-canonical, anti-establishment is Gnostic, a form of exclusive knowledge reserved for the faithful. The truth you must have eyes to see. Yeah. I mean, that, I again, I was just like, oh, man, like, what do you do with that? I mean, what really, like, what, that's an honest question. What do you do with that? I think, well, that that is, you know, it's an interesting question because people always say, how do you talk to people who believe this, right, who are seeing other things? Um, you know, for instance... Uh, part of the Gnosticism is, you know, Trump's tweets when he could tweet, and I guess he can now, um, always filled with misspellings and strange capitalizations. Code. Code for those who can see. Um, And there's any number of these sort of... I I sat in a car at a Trump rally with with, uh, uh, a woman named Diane, and, you know, a smart woman doing this sort of endless numerology and feeling this access to power. And I should say, uh, I I teach at a college, Dartmouth College. I have access to a library. Now they feel they have access to the invisible archive too. It's part of why it feels like a democratizing force to them. They feel like they're making the story with Trump. How do you argue against that? What do you do about that? People are always saying, how do we talk sense into them? Well, as I said, I have a, 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 a queer child. If someone said to me, if one of these, uh, there is in fact a, uh, a right-wing group suing my, my, my child's school district now are preparing to do so uh, with an anti, uh, anti-LGBTQ suit. That I, that's how I would characterize it. And uh, if they came to me and they said, Jeff, how do we talk sense into you? Right. The answer is you don't. Right. You're not going to get me to believe that, 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 that trans folks aren't human. That's not going to happen or that they don't exist. I'm not interested in trying, I'm not interested in, and you could say, oh, well, isn't that the end of liberal democracy, the end of persuasion? I think we have fetishized the debate stage. We have fetishized common ground. I think common ground, you know what common ground is, is a plantation. That was common ground. Um, The right has forced, and another old song, Florence Reese, a labor song, which side are you on? 
the right has forced us into a which side are you on. And I think this is especially hard for many people of of good faith. And I mean, I mean, spiritual faith, because the whole idea is we're interested in other people's beliefs and we want to respect them and honor them. And we don't want to think in uh, uh, in terms of uh, sides. But that old union song, there are no neutrals in Harlan County. When when the gunmen are shooting, which side are you on? Mm. When they are criminalizing trans people, trying to make lists of kids, and list making of deviants has a historical precedent, mm. and it's terrifying. Mm. Um, which side are you on? Yeah. And and you can use empathy for the devil and say, hey, I want to understand how you think, but I'm standing over here. Yeah. I'm 100% standing yeah. over I, here. It makes me think about, um, there's a really interesting chapter about Wisconsin, uh, in which you um, introduced me to a book that I had never heard. And I, I, what, what was the name of that book? That Wis- from- Wisconsin Death Trip, uh, it, a lodestar of my life in a weird way. It is... I, I was like, and from I'm from Wisconsin. Oh, you are, by the way. Of course, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. but I'm from like Madison, which yeah. you know, you know, you, you know, the, that's not Wisconsin. I know, though. right? You know, well, it is actually Wisconsin. It's very Wisconsin, you know, right? I know. You know, it, you know, that's the sort of the fascinating. We've had to like kind of. You know, there's a lot of people. You're not Wisconsin, but actually, we are Wisconsin. The uh, motto agree. forward. You know, what I mean, like it's we. This is a very deep Wisconsin important part of Wisconsin history. Um, but Wisconsin, of course, is. Did, very did you read that book, The Fall of Wisconsin? No, I haven't read that. Oh, fascinating. Uh, uh, more of a political journalist uh, yeah. account of like what the hell happened to Wisconsin? Yeah. You know, th- the forward state, the the state that you still they go and they sell. P- what if you go to the tourist bureau? They say they sell beautiful posters of their socialist mayors <laughs> of Milwaukee. Um, yeah, well, you know, so much good. And I, I was in Wisconsin uh, for about on and off for about six months uh, while my child went through a, 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 a program there, health program there. And um, I was there when Roe fell. Mm, And Wisconsin became the first blue state uh, in the union uh, for uh, reproductive freedom to be absolutely curtailed. No exceptions. It reverted to 1849 law, Um, partly because it's still a a bluish, purplish state, but so gerrymandered that there's a governor holding on just barely and and doing vetoes, but the legislature's out of control. So I took as my guide this book, Wisconsin Death Trip, by a man named Michael Lessie, who 30 years ago was my teacher. Michael Lessie was at Madison. Uh, He was at Madison, you know, uh, when the bombing was the uh, political violence. There's political violence in the left history as well, right? Um, These guys had an airplane that they were dropping bombs from, this, this radical left group. And uh, he was looking at things falling apart in 1973, same year as Roe. And he looks in this archive of the 1890s of this little town, Black River Falls, just a town photographer. What are they taking pictures of? You know what they took a lot of pictures of? Dead babies. Mm. That's what you did. Photography was rare when when your baby died, and they died a lot early. You put the baby in its best clothes and you put it in a coffin and you propped it up and you took a photograph. Mm. One mother commissioned an artist to paint open eyes onto <sighs> the dead baby. And then he starts reading the newspaper, the banner, a paper that is still there and still strange. Black River Falls, this little town. Um, and it's filled in the 1890s. And this book, by the way, had a major role in sort of American historiography and sort of revising a revisionist view of, you know what, the pastoral, beautiful, sm- the MAGA, the MAGA of the 18th, the small town America, uh, page after page of people losing their mind, going to the state asylum, mm. uh, a woman driven mad by uh, her inability uh, uh, to get an abortion, um, uh, 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 queer love affairs that are prosecuted or end in suicide, arsons, people falling down wells, um, then as now, essentially, mm, um, the more yeah. things change. And I thought, well, this book, though, all right, I think that's a hopeful book. That story to me, what I just told you, is a hopeful story, right? Because we've been, this the struggle is long. We've mm. been in this darkness before. Mm. This is not a crisis. This is not a crisis of democracy. It's not even a climate crisis. It's our condition, it's mm. the world we live in. Mm. The question is not, how does this story end? The question is, how does it continue? Mm. Because the world didn't end in 1890, it didn't end in 1973, and it's not going to end now. Yeah, well, I mean, it's very interesting. It comes to a head because you have these, you know, you have 
a story in there about a woman who's doing IVF yeah. and doesn't know if she can put in, you know, the three um, eggs because she's worried that if, if you know, for she health was, reasons. She was at the clinic. Yeah. When they in, 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 the, in the examination room, uh, nurse steps out, comes back in crying. Yeah. When when Roe comes down and and it's just like uh, we've been advised by our council we can't do this anymore. Right. Um, and uh, fortunately, they've been able to go forward. Right. But in a world that's also uh, it's a queer couple, and uh, right. you know right. they're, no, I mean, they're that terror we, we, that they're we facing. We did that too. There's an amazing scene, and I saw her picture, and this young girl oh. has a sign <laughs> that says. F off, and it's on. It's that moment, and these like these kind of cheerleader types. You know, I mean, she's like, a cheerleader. Peyton, the, you know, Peyton the, is the, a, the cheerleader in the Black you know, River Falls uh, Tigers. Yeah, yes. and a bunch of like, and 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 their friends. They are like, we're not going to stand for this. We're like, you know, and and it's very interesting because they talk about war. They are, and you I think know, I think and, they're and then both... on the other side you have this like this guy who who's she knew uh, his. His daughter, I'd grown up skating, uh, they, figure skating, and they, and they come and like they're they're on the other side of the bridge holding up fetuses, and you know I mean Brian and H and his he's got his guy, Brian, a preacher named Brian H and he's there with his wife. His wife's more militant than him. Um, his wife, he's he's still nonviolent. His wife says the church has uh, Roe unleashed the church and it's time for war. Mm. Um, and they've got their kids. Uh, on the bridge, the bridge over the Black River into town. I drive up to Black... I don't have any plans. I'm just going mm. places, Black River Falls, mm. and I pull in. They've got their kids with their signs of fetuses and so on. The kids have been promised ice cream if they yeah. hold these bloody signs for a while. And then there's this group of uh, young women and, and queer kids and uh, high school students, college students, and Peyton. Uh, can I say it on your show? Uh, can I honor her, her, her language? You, uh, There's a beautiful portrait. I, I my books these days are are also part photographic yeah, and and, which and, I love. and respect of Wisconsin yeah. Death Trip, and Peyton, cheerleader. The day after row or a couple days after row, she's on the bridge with a sign, and her sign is F off. Um, and and actually, can I read Peyton's little bit? There? I, I would love for you to read. Uh, a cheerleader for the Black River Falls Tigers named Peyton arrived with her f*** sign. It means, she said, if you don't believe in women's rights, you can just literally go f*** off. You ain't getting no pussy. You ain't getting nothing. It meant, she said, rage. And I think our generation has to contend and recognize and respect the rage. Peyton and her friends, wonderful kids, when we, we all retired to Perkins, as you do in a small town, for waffles, late night waffles and pancakes and so on, and we're talking. And I was, they were so earnest and so hopeful and so excited about going to Madison and, and so on. I, I was almost hesitant to bring up Civil War, which is wherever I went in the country, the only variations of the answer were you were, yeah, you thought Great Division was coming and you were sad about it, but it had to happen, or you were looking forward to it. I thought this would be not. You know, they're young, earnest kids. I thought that and they're like, oh yeah, absolutely. And one, uh, a wonderful uh, young woman, she's going in the armed forces to get skills, to get prepared. This is small town Wisconsin. All but one uh, was armed and knew how to use their guns and said, you know, come at us. Um, the one who didn't uh, was a sort of leader. She was an archer. And they said, she's our Katniss, like in the Hunger Games, you know, the children's book. is, You know, and there is a child's fantasy to that, right? Because if there's a civil war, a group of student, this is not Red Dawn. The high school team is not going to be out there with their guns. Um, I think we're in a slow civil war now. It's simmering. I don't share their belief in violence, but I take courage in the fact that they understand that the stakes are dire. The stakes are their lives, as they put it. This is our life on the line and climate and law and, and everything. Um, this, is, this is an all-in fight. And, and they're not looking at this and saying, well, but I just want to, you know, I just want to go to school and have fun. It's not my, why is it my fault? They're, they're very clear. It's not their fault. It's our fault, yours and mine, this older generation, um, and they're going to have to fight. I hope nonviolently, um, but uh, I'm not in a position to tell them, to lecture them on how the struggle continues. Right.
When, when you say the slow civil war, what does that mean? Does that just mean perennial? I think it's, well, right. <laughs> you know, there, there, there's, there's, there's folks who argue like, wait, what do you mean another civil war? The last one hasn't ended. Um, but I do, and I, but I don't, I'm not of that position that says, you know, well, it's, there's always been terrible things. What do you mean fascism's coming? There's been pockets of fascism and communities of color that have experienced fascism, but we have not had a full fascist government before, and we still don't. Um, but it's on the table. Um, and some of the conditions that had never, the cult of personality, the open reverence for violence, um, the delight, the pleasure in violence, that was not part of an official party platform before. I think in terms of the slow civil war, though, I, uh, you know, people have been asking me now for several years, do you think there'll be violence? I'm like, what do you mean, will be? There, there, there is violence. There, there's, uh, if you pay attention, every weekend, uh, look, uh, you can follow, uh, follow the Antifa. Uh, and they're there fighting, by the way. I mean, I'm not in a place to lecture them. I saw Antifa fight the Proud Boys. Uh, um, in that battle, there were no victims. There were two groups that came to fight, and that's what they did. Um, um, but... Uh, there's skirmishes like that all over the country. Every weekend, a drag show. Um, think about the places that are getting bomb threats, that are getting attacks, that are getting loan, so-called loan wa- libraries, hospitals, mm. schools. Mm. Pay attention to what's being attacked. I think there's a chapter in the book called TikTok, and which is a QAnon, uh, a QAnon uh, um, slogan, and so I, I call her Evelyn because there's Evelyns everywhere. Uh, I was fascinated by the way that we hear about, every now and then we'll hear about a QAnon murder, some uh, person driven mad by QAnon and kills their whole family. Um, And if you haven't been paying attention, there's been several of those. What we don't hear about are all the Evelyns. Evelyn, thank God, did not succeed in killing anyone. She was a kind of a liberal Austin, Texas hipster and went down the rabbit hole and became convinced that children were being stolen everywhere and she had to go and rescue them, began ramming her cars into people that she thought, other cars she thought were stealing children. Thank God no one was badly hurt. That didn't make national news. It didn't make local news. Mm. That's happening all over the place. Assaults, kidnappings, men, you know, standoffs with, with assault rifles on either side. That war is here, and most of all, I do think, because of the front line now, but I, I think any listener is saying, well, that's terrible what they're doing to the trans people. I hear liberals say this. How many times do we have to go around with fascism for you not to get that they come for everybody? The target right now is trans people. Don't forget, when Trump came into power, it was Muslims. Then it was undocumented folks. It doesn't matter. It's mm. just an enemy. Mm. But they're criminalizing trans folks and queer folks women are dying because they can't have their reproductive rights there's a death toll so i think it's a slow civil war Mm. it's a simmer it may never get beyond a simmer nothing is inevitable fascism is a politics of inevitability our dream our dream politics our imagination has to be a politics of possibility but not the possibility where we say it's going to work out the possibility where we say this is terrible this is terrible let's recognize it our lives are on the line yeah i mean it's it's right here in chelsea new york there are people many people protesting drag shows it's stunning it's stunning yeah um so okay this is the you're gonna hate this question but i'm gonna say it because (laughs) i ask every single guest and you're not gonna be accepted all right what gives you hope Oh, um, no, I like that question. (laughs) Um, I mean, one of the things, right, like, uh, the reason I go around sometimes talking to fascists um, is weirdly that gives me hope. Not because we're all the same, we're all, no. um, It does give me probably a little bit of a false sense of agency. Look, I can make this book. I can do something. Um, um, I can confront these fears. I can both understand um, the vastness of their dream and see the smallness of the people dreaming it. Um, uh, I can see the fault lines in their movement. And I think 
from afar, it's easy to look at the right as monolithic, but no social movement. And that's what fascism is. Social movement is not a term that belongs to the left. It's there can be good ones and bad ones. This is a bad one. Social movements are great convergence. We know this in the history of the left. Social movements, different factions coming together and eventually they crack up. What gives me hope are those fault lines. What gives me hope are those kids in Black River Falls with their big hearts. What gives me hope is Lee Hayes saying, for a while it's possible not to be scared even, to say that I try to thread, there's a lot of darkness in the book, but I try to thread sort of some beauty and loveliness throughout it. And and, and maybe, all right, here's my hope. I'm at a church in Miami called Vu Church. And it's like, this is part of the undertow. It's not officially a right-wing church, but it is. It's a, a kind of a hipster, uh, a hipster church. What's the one in New York? There's a big one, Pastor Carl so. Lentz. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and this one is pastored by uh, a guy. He he officiated at Kanye's and uh, Kim Kardashian's uh, ill-fated uh, marriage. He is the pastor to Justin Bieber. Everyone in this church is gorgeous and beautiful, and um, it is a right-wing church. But they don't talk about that. Um, and they are very anxious about my presence and they want to stage, man. they actually say, let's just stage it to the story. I end up talking to one member of the church, kind of a holy fool, a guy named Brandon. He kind of, a beautiful man, things get given to him, he doesn't understand why. It's like, you're a really good looking guy. People think you're gorgeous and they just want to be around you. He thinks it's all God. Well, maybe not, but... He starts telling me about his vision. They talk in this church about the city of God, by which they mean Miami, by which they do not mean the poor people surrounding their church who they hire cops to keep out. Um, I said, what's the city of God look like to you, Brandon? I think it's going to be terrifying. He says, well, I think first thing is all the debt would be canceled. Um, and, and then he starts imagining the city and he said, you know, and and there would be enough work for everybody, but not too much work for anyone. And there would be, and and we wouldn't judge each other by status and wealth and everyone would have enough. And it's a familiar vision. It's a beautiful vision. This church came and said, oh, you can't talk to that guy. Stop. That's not the message. But the message is there even in that right wing church. That guy has that vision. He doesn't know. He doesn't know he's a socialist. Um, uh, that gives me hope that 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 vision uh, endures even within, you know, forgive the phrase, uh, uh, the heart of darkness of Trumpism. Mm. Jeff Charlotte is the best-selling author of The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power, which Netflix turned into a documentary series a few years ago, and C Street, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy. The brand new book is titled The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. You've got to read this book. Jeff, thank you so much for speaking with thank us. Thank you, Paul. Thanks very much. And with that, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for this week's show. We need your help keeping this show on the air, and I hope you'll consider being a partner in this crucial work by making a financial contribution today. Information on how to donate is available at stateofbelief.com. That is stateofbelief.com. And you can also be part of making sure informative and encouraging voices like these are heard by sharing this program with friends and family. Let's get more people listening and more people taking part in these conversations, both on and off the air. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the weekly State of Belief podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And join the conversation. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at State of Belief and share State of Belief with the people in your life. State of Belief is produced by Ray Kirstein and is a production of Interfaith Alliance. Become a member today at interfaithalliance.org. And be sure to join us next week. I can't wait. Until then, I'm Paul Rauschenbusch on the State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet. Oh.